She says that she was supposed to write a poem about herself when she was 12. You guys, let me just say this right now. I spent five years of my life teaching writing to sixth graders, okay? <laughs> my bread and butter was teaching writing to 12 year olds, okay? Um, they can't write, even when they're super well educated. A 12 year old cannot write well. I've met maybe one or two. And there are words and turns of phrases here that I guarantee you are not the work of a 12 year old. And I think what is so shatteringly embarrassing for her is that what seems evident to me is she maybe did write a poem with themes similar to this, but I believe that she rewrote this poem as an adult. She wanted to recite this for you so that you could think of her as this poignant young poet who was struggling uh, being a child of divorce. I'm going to read it for you. Now remember, in this episode, she says, I had to write a poem when I was 12 and I remember it, I'll say it for you. And then she goes on to rattle it off. Like it's not even something she has to recall or be like, okay, I know um, I, I wrote a poem about this and it was a long time ago, but I do remember part of it. No, she knew it verbatim, didn't skip a beat. She just like rattled that off. I cannot tell you one poem I wrote like last year. B.S. Megan, you didn't write this poem, but here's it goes. Hello, how are you? Welcome to my channel. My name is Cheer Denise, and today we're going to be doing episode two of the Harry and Meghan Netflix docu-series. There's six episodes, and we're going to go through every single one of them. And I just wanted to thank you guys so much for being so supportive of the first episode of this series that we are doing. I didn't know how this recap would be received because it is an old docu-series, and we've discussed Harry and Meghan before on this channel, so I wasn't sure if there would be much appetite for it, but you guys really showed your support for that last video, so thank you so very much. This episode is just as nauseating as the last one and possibly more boring. <laughs> I didn't think it would be possible, but again, I struggled to get through it. I watched the episode twice, um, once just to watch it and the second time to take notes on it so I'd have something meaningful to say so I could like remember what they talked about because it cuts constantly we're talking about this and then suddenly we're talking about this and suddenly we're talking about this and I'm trying to find a narrative throughout to help me tell the story to you but it's hard because I just feel like they jump around a lot so it's very difficult to recap it so that you don't feel like I'm jumping around anyway um one of the things I realized as I was watching it is that I think that if you didn't know much about Harry and Meghan it would have been really easy to become convinced through this documentary that these people were telling the truth we know from so much of the reading that we've done that these people are shady and despicable and function in the world as deceivers. But on camera, um, and for the most part, I don't find her presentation to be really grating or appalling. I think that if you didn't know anything about her and you were just watching this person tell the story of their life, I don't think she has an unpleasant voice. I don't think she has... A, a lot of annoying mannerisms. Um, she's pretty just vanilla, honestly. There are definitely things she does and says that if you're if you're watching it with a critical eye, you'd be like, okay, really? Like the whole bowing scene, which is in this episode, we're going to get all into that. Um, different times when it feels like there's nothing in this entire docuseries that is ever negative of her. They're completely deprecating of Harry all the time. He's self-deprecating. They are a little disdainful of some of his actions. They always act like, can you believe he fell ass backwards into his good luck to get with this American actress? But there's nothing in the docuseries that would criticize her, even marginally. There's no oblique reference to any fault she may have. And so that just comes off as there's something to hide because in a documentary that is about how much people dislike you, you need to give reasons why they would come to that conclusion. The whole world isn't crazy. So why is it that everyone would just like leap on you and find, find fault with you for no reason? The very fact that the documentary won't address that lends credence to everyone's objections about her. If they had decided to find even even one tiny thing, this manipulation would have gone so much further if they had, if they had decided to find one tiny thing to criticize her about. As it stands, the only thing from this entire episode that even had the shade of a potential 
fault, and I wouldn't even say this is a fault, uh, was they were talking about her acting career. You know, obviously it never really took off. And they have one of her former castmates or friends or something, I can't remember who it was, discussing her acting career and saying that that was never really a huge priority for her. That she just liked being part of a thing, like being part of a cast. But that her interests really fell more to charity work, service, and aid to others. So even in that, they spin it to be like, well, she didn't care about acting because her heart is so big. She cared about the world. She cared about real things and women's rights and all of this garbage and junk. You know, so even the one opportunity where they could have like had something to say, and it's not a negative thing that her acting career didn't take off, but even just that one tiny thing that would have just uh, made her seem uh, more human, like she's not perfect in everything. But even in that one thing, they can't just be honest that she wasn't a very good actress. And that's why it didn't go anywhere. It's not because she was so worried about the world and getting water to the poor African children. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me just dive in and tell you this episode from start to finish. Starts out with that scene that we've all seen a thousand times because it's so stupid that everyone liked to replay this scene. And even now, as I think about it, I'm just like, <laughs> it's so dumb. They're getting in the car. They're, they're in a the garage. There's a camera set up in the car to film them as they're getting in. And it's just so many shots like this, by the way. Sorry, side note. So many shots are like, who is this third person that's filming them? You know, it's one thing when they have their little video diaries. Okay, that's semi-believable. But, you know, the, these beautiful black and white photographs of them in their house, you know, uh, this, this footage of somebody filming them as they're getting in the car, it's like, we're supposed to believe that they are just these two super normal per- people who just have had a really tough blow and they're just trying to find truth and trying to help you find truth. And you're supposed to completely not notice the fact that they literally uh, were making a documentary about their lives with Netflix. Like, what are we supposed to think that this just kind of like fell out of the sky, already created, Netflix picked it up and was like, oh, a show. You know, who who is this person that's filming them? Anyway, they get in the car. Here's a camera. Harry comes in from one side, H. Megan comes in from the other. You can sense that there's agitation, and as they're pulling away, one of the other, one of their security members who's sitting in the front seat mentions that there is a paparazzi on a scooter. Now, they seem to have had some kind of brush up or run in or experience with this guy in the past. And both Harry and Megan like perk up. What? What? He's following us? Where? Where? Harry's like, You know, he, he's straining the entire time in this scene to like make eyes with this with this person who's following them. And, you know, and they, they and what's wild to me is I'm like, there's literally a camera in your car. Supposedly the man in the scooter is right behind you. Also, you both have your phones. How about a little footage of the guy following you? You know, because it's like, what are you worried about his identity? These people are coming after you constantly. And they keep saying that there's all of these paparazzi, all these people coming after them, all of this stuff is happening. They can't have any privacy. Megan mentions that there was two guys filming them as they were trying to leave the garage. She just wants Harry to know that. Just note that for our security. I just want you to be aware of that, she says. Okay. But then why didn't we get footage of the guy filming them? Like, you have a camera ready. Prove to us that there's trouble coming. Prove to us. Explain to us why you guys are so frantic and scared so they're like driving along harry keeps craning around to find the person that's after them um megan is kind of like like detaching from this from the situation it's like she's trying to steal herself she reaches over and grabs harry's hand like steady me steady me i'm so scared and he says well in 10 minutes we're going to be with friends so don't worry in 10 minutes it'll all be all right it'll be over in 10 minutes just be strong and they're, they're plotting what they're going to do if, if, if things get dangerous, if the paparazzi gets too close, they're going to dart into a garage because, as she says, remember, safety first, okay? Safety first. It's just so sickening because it's such, it's so theatrical and so play-acted, you know? And I just, I, nobody believes that there was anyone coming after them in that situation. And I just want to say, look, I'll be fair. I believe that there was a lot of paparazzi when they first got together. I believe that when she was in Toronto and the news broke that she was dating Harry, that her life changed, that there were actually people following her now who weren't before because she was his love interest. I believe that. I'll even go so far as to say that Harry, who says it used to be different, 
back in the time of my mom, you know, it was physical harassment, but now it's the whole, the whole online world is just targeted towards my wife. And there's people who want to be like, oh, come off of it. Now, the reality is there are people who really get off on the sport of hating Harry and Meghan. Like they love it. Love it, love it, love it. Um, it's, it's as interesting to them to watch videos that hate on Harry and Meghan as it is for people who are like really into, I don't know, soccer or football or baseball. Um, and people are really mean about her and seem to have like a real vendetta against her, like a personal dislike and hatred for her. But even if that's true, then Harry, don't read it. Don't watch it. Don't involve yourself in it. Don't feed into it. The more you feed into it, the more you allow people to criticize you. Because then you want to start wilding out talking about how people shouldn't have freedom of speech and coming up in our country saying that we shouldn't allow free speech here, that it's wild that we would have it. You know, just because he can't learn to shut down his phone, stop engaging in social media, like stop reading the tabloids. That's a you problem, man. That's not an American problem. Anyway, with that being said, we then have to dive into what in the world was life like for Harry and Meghan once the news broke of them and their relationship, and it all been secretive and clandestine, and they were having their little love story secret from the world, and they were taking plane rides back and forth, and nobody knew, and it was like this big secret they got to have with each other. But the news is broken now, and so what of it? What's going to happen? Well, what happens is that the media, supposedly, and I, I do believe this, descended on Megan and her life looked completely different. Something I noticed, which is a bit of a side note, but I'm going to say here anyway. As they're talking about how the paparazzi have descended on Megan and have decided to change her life irreparably, and she'll never be able to go back to just being Meghan Markle, who nobody knows or cares about. There's paparazzi lining her street. She claims that the neighbor guy was paid off by paparazzi to affix a camera to the side of his house that gives like live feed of her backyard. So she felt like she couldn't even use her backyard anymore. As they're painting this picture, I'm like watching the footage and they show her house. Look, her house would have been perfectly fine for just any old person, right? It's a, like a townhouse or something in Toronto. It's a modest home. I'm sure it's expensive in Toronto. I don't know what housing prices are, and I don't know what she was really being paid as an actress, but all I'm saying is her house was pretty modest home. Then I think about when she moved to Kensington Palace, which was a small cottage, but so cute, so charming, delightful. And for a person who makes her living, not from acting, but from her website, The Tig, it stands to reason to me that wouldn't you rather live in this super charming English cottage with all of its history, picturesque fairy tale vibes, versus this hideous townhouse, if I'm honest with you, in Toronto? Like, she wasn't criticizing her her living situation there, but as soon as she goes to live in the little cottage on Kensington Palace grounds, suddenly that's not good enough. But I'm like, that clunky townhouse in Toronto was just fine for you five seconds ago. Now actually living in a little dream house, And you're going to complain? Okay, sorry. I keep getting sidetracked. Back to the story. So as they're talking about the paparazzi just digging into her life, of course, the question then comes, like, who even is she? Where did she even come from? We are introduced to Doria, Megan's mom. Doria and Megan actually look very similar. I don't think I had ever really realized how similar they look. But more than that, they sound exactly the same. I was not expecting Doria to sound like she did. Like, when she opened her mouth, I was like, Wow, I I don't know what I expected you to sound like, but that isn't it. She has this kind of sort of California, like, upspeak, the way Megan kind of does a little bit. Um, And anyway, she starts talking about Megan and how Megan was this real brainiac growing up. You know, she's just, she's a total package, but mostly brains is what Megan is. And she recalls the first time that she ever met Harry and she thought that Harry was just this super well-bred, well-mannered, nice guy and was happy that her daughter had found somebody who could seemingly treat her so well because he obviously was very into her. But she also does talk about how everything had changed for Megan because of the paparazzi. And so we talk more about that. It's just like this continual thing about how plagued she is. And Harry hops on to say it was also really stressful for him as well because the tabloids were writing stories about things from Megan's past that he didn't even know anything about and so he said he was constantly coming to her asking her is that true did you really do that are you really seeing this person well what's the story with that guy well I don't like him at all is he still around you know and so it 
created all of this tension within their relationship very early on before it had just been this beautiful love story. And then it was this, everyone was really excited about, ooh, this Meghan Markle, this is very exciting. She's exotic. And then it became, let's dig around up all the things about her past. And then Harry got really upset and involved. Okay, so two things, by the way. First thing is, okay, Harry, I thought you were the one that's always saying the tabloids lie. So why in the world are you picking them up, reading it, and then getting all nervous and jerky because you think your wife is involved in some nefarious situations with other men? <laughs> she was. But that's the thing. Actually, the tabloids aren't always lying. Do they have crazy, wild stories all the time? Yeah, because people are crazy and wild and do weird things in Hollywood. And uh, m many people who are of elite status are living some crazy lives, you know? I think that the tabloids are probably right a lot more than they are wrong, unfortunately. I mean, yeah, I think they make up some stuff for sure. But I think that Harry realizes from his own experience, knowing that they were constantly saying that he was drunk, doing cocaine and sleeping with girls in the back alley, they said all those things and he knew they were true. He didn't like that they said them and that's what he, that's why he always had a reaction about it, but he knew it was true. So likewise, they start saying things about Megan. Of course, he knows that it might be true, you know? So he's nervous about it and that's throwing a wrench in their relationship. But the other thing I thought as I was watching him tell his sad story about, I didn't know what to believe and Megan saying, yeah, it was really hard because it really had to speed up a lot of conversations uh, in a relationship. And it, it, it could have been very damaging to a young relationship, having all of that negativity suddenly thrown in. The thing that I kept thinking uh, as I saw them do all these cinematic side shots of her talking, these super close-up cinematic shots, the production value is so manipulative. I, I kind of think that they, like, they overdid it with the cinematic close-ups, the super dramatic music, the... Uh, the different shots of Diana, who's, you know, being hounded by paparazzi and then again, cutting to Megan so that you're supposed to be creating these connections between the hounded princess and the hounded woman, you know, who's just trying to have a sweet and normal and natural relationship with this redheaded guy. We, we would have, I think, received the story even, even better if they had decided to just kind of cut out all the fancy frills and manipulative cinematography and production value and just like had them tell their story. Like I think cutting things down dramatically would have enhanced the sense of reality and truth being offered. I don't know, that's just a side note. But anyway, we go back to the question of, so who is Megan? Because as Harry is wondering, you know, may I guess there's things I don't know about. Then the documentary goes back more to her childhood. We we get more of Doria and we have Megan and Doria in a bus of some sort going back to all of their old stomping grounds. We see this place that they used to live over a garage or something and and they're reminiscing about how it used to be. Now, Megan has told a lot of different stories uh, about her growing up years. She claims her mom raised her. Again, she makes that fairly clear in this documentary as well. She talks mostly about being with her mom, uh, not giving a super clear timeline about when she was with her mom. We know that when she was growing up, from Thomas Markle and also just from other sources that she didn't live with her mom when she was young. Later on, she, when she was older, uh, past middle school and into high school, she and her mom had a lot more to do with each other. But growing up years, no, it was Megan and her dad. And now in this documentary, there's very little said about her dad. He's like this figure that she doesn't talk badly about, but she doesn't go out of her way to really discuss how close they actually were. She says at one point, yeah, I was a daddy's girl, but she doesn't explain what that actually looked like or why she would say that when she tries to say that she spent all her time with her mom. And then later she's like, I was a daddy's girl and I was with him a lot. Well, which is it? Who knows? But we get lots of them going around to the old neighborhood and you know, you're supposed to get this idea, like from the conversation they're having as they're looking back at the old places they used to live, that it was really just this, you know, that the poignant story of the single mom 
raising her daughter in a mostly black and ethnic neighborhood and just raising her with the help of other female friends and relatives. It's got the makings of a real 1990s feel-good drama that's tinged with just enough you know, domestic violence to make it seem real. But in the end, the mother and the daughter rise up with the help of many female friends and relatives to own their life, own their narrative, and they go on to do great and mighty things. That's kind of like the vibe we're supposed to get from this whole interaction. She goes and stops by what used to be called the Little Red Schoolhouse. I think it's now like the Hollywood Schoolhouse, or I don't know what it is. They meet up with the headmaster, or the principal, I don't know what they call them. And the headmaster brings out this old yearbook that Megan had signed. And there's like this whole thing in the back that she wrote, and they make a big thing about her penmanship and how good it was even back then. And she writes, you know, when I become really rich and famous, I'm going to make sure to mention you specifically. And it's like, really? Okay. And so they have this like warm, fuzzy moment because look, I'm coming for full circle. I'm just that kind of person. I didn't forget I told you that. All right. But then of course, what would Megan do recounting her childhood if she didn't let you know that she single-handedly changed the course of the feminist movement? I don't even have the energy to talk about it. I hate this story so much. Do we remember the ivory liquid commercial? She is just such a liar about this. It's painful. It's painful like how colossal the lies are. She says she saw the detergent commercial. She was offended for all women across the universe. And so she wrote to the company and said, you need to change it and don't say like women of the world can do their dishes. Now say people of the world can do their dishes or whatever the line was. And we're supposed to completely ignore the fact that the documentary is using footage as they tell the story of Meghan Markle, who had done a, like a spot for cable TV or something about this whole thing. Her whole class had written letters. Her dad like filmed it and made like a short video about it. And she's reading her letter. They reenact how apparently she was watching TV at school or something. And they saw the commercial come up on TV. And then the boys were all like, ha ha ha, keep the women in the kitchen. And Megan was like, I don't like that. That's not nice to women. We need freedom. We need rights. So then she writes her letter and, you know, but the story's lame. It's a stupid story anyway. The fact that she would still, at the age that she is, still wear that like a feather in her cap, still act like this was a big story that's worthy of your attention and mine. Then, of course, and she's going to talk about herself as a young child. She's got to talk about what life was like being a mixed person, you know, mom's black, dad's white. That means her life's going to be terrible because she won't be able to find her place in the world. She says that the first time she realized that life could be different was when somebody screamed the N-word at her mom at like a traffic light or something. And then her mom's knuckles turned white as she gripped the steering wheel. (laughs) Where have we heard that story before? Oh, everywhere she's ever talked. She has just a few stories she recycles. She has no new ideas, no new stories. I'm like, did only three things happen to you in your life? Your dad bought you the Barbie dolls and made it a mixed family Barbie doll set. You wrote a letter to the dishwashing company and your mom's knuckles turned white when somebody called her the N-word. Hey, look, I'm sorry if somebody did call your mom the N-word. That sucks if somebody would do that. That's really mean and hateful. Also, she survived and you survived. If somebody wants to be a loser, that doesn't have to affect you forever. That was, I mean, people are hateful when they're driving. People scream out hateful things all the time and act like they have had no raising constantly and continually. The number of times that people just like, people are mean. They get behind the wheels of their car and they turn into monsters. So I'm, I'm, yeah, it sucks that somebody did that and, and was mean to her mom like that. But did that need to make her question her identity as a biracial child? Well, it did. And That leads into this whole conversation in this episode, which was exceedingly boring, about her struggle with race. And we just, I think the thing that's so frustrating to me in this episode alone was that she talks about race in two very separate ways and her experience with race in two very separate ways. In one point in the documentary, she says that she did not even identify with the fact that she was a biracial individual. She was just a human being in the world. Never even occurred to her that she was biracial because nobody treated her any differently than they treated anybody else. Again, she was just a human in the world. And she says that 
that she didn't really even think about her race. She says no one ever identified me as being black. It never came up. She says that the time that she finally realized that she was black, really, or half black anyway, was when she got with Harry. And that in the UK, it became such a huge deal that she was black. And that Harry was choosing to date a half black woman. And because they made a big deal of it, suddenly she realized, oh yeah, I am biracial. I guess that is a thing about me. Um, But then she wants to tell this whole long story later on about how, yeah, growing up was really hard for me because I was always, I, I didn't know where I fit. I didn't know, was I white or was I black? Well, how can both those things happen? You literally just said you never thought about it until you were engaged to Harry and the UK tabloids made a big deal about it. But now suddenly you want to tell me the sob story about how you just didn't know what to do in life. Your whole growing up years, you were just struggling constantly because somebody called your mom the N-word and you realized there's haters out there. I, I, I'm not trying to be mean. I mean, I'm sorry if she experienced like racism, but I don't think she did because she can't explain to me when and how that happened. Because we got two separate timelines going on, two separate explanations of her life in literally the same episode. But despite the fact that Harry is... Uh, as white as snow and she was fumbling around trying to figure out where her place was in the world just because their skin is different color they actually had a lot of things in common namely their parents were both divorced so that's hard and so that gives Megan a chance to debut the poem that she wrote when she was 12 that she still remembers and she wants to recite it for you she says that and I'm gonna call on this story she says that she was supposed to write a poem about herself when she was 12. You guys, let me just say this right now. I spent five years of my life teaching writing to sixth graders, okay? (laughs) My bread and butter was teaching writing to 12 year olds, okay? Um, They can't write, even when they're super well educated, a 12 year old cannot write well. I've met maybe one or two. And I'm gonna tell you right now that this poem is in large part the work of a 12 year old. But there are words and turns of phrases here that I guarantee you are not the work of a 12-year-old. And I think what is so shatteringly embarrassing for her is that what it seems evident to me is she maybe did write a poem with themes similar to this, but I believe that she rewrote this poem as an adult um, and she kept some of the rhymy sing-songiness of it to make it appear younger. Or maybe she really thinks this is a good poem. But but she wanted to recite this for you so that you could think of her as this poignant young poet who was struggling uh, being a child of divorce. I've written it for you. I'm going to read it for you. Now remember, in this episode, she says, I had to write a poem when I was 12 and I remember it. I'll say it for you. And then she goes on to rattle it off. Like it's not even something she has to recall or be like, okay, I know um, I, I wrote a poem about this and it was a long time ago, but I do remember part of it. No, she knew it verbatim, didn't skip a beat. She just like rattled that off. I cannot tell you one poem I wrote like last year, let alone what I wrote tw- like when I was 12 years old and I'm now well into my 30s. Like, I, I, B.S. Megan, you didn't write this poem, but here's it goes. Two houses, two homes, two kitchens, two phones, two couches where I lay, two places that I stay. Moving, moving here and there from Monday to Friday, I'm everywhere. Don't get me wrong, it's not that bad, but oftentimes it makes me sad. I want to live that nuclear life with a happy dad and a loving wife, a picket fence, a shaggy dog, a fireplace with a burning log. But it's not real, it's just a dream. I cannot cry or even scream. So here I sit with cat number three. Life would be easy if there were two of me. She didn't write that when she was 12. She wrote that like before the documentary and thought she would debut it as a poem she wrote when she was 12. First of all, you would not recall that poem. You just would not. You wouldn't. I also know a 12-year-old didn't write that poem because a 12-year-old would not refer to a family with a mother and father as that nuclear life. As far as a 12-year-old understands, the word nuclear means like a bomb. Nuclear power. But there, there's no understanding of the economic concept of the nuclear family. I don't think a 12-year-old would refer to having a mother and a father in a home as living that nuclear life. That's not like street lingo. Like, no. And I just don't believe that she was like this you know, major brainiac. If she was that major brainiac, the, po- the poem as a whole would be way better than it is. 
I mean, this thing songy, two houses, two homes, two kitchens, two phones, two couches where I lay, two places where I stay. I believe a 12-year-old wrote that. But I just think that this is the biggest, like, this is, it's just so lame. The, just the presentation of it, her wanting to just get it in the documentary. I'm like, you don't have anything more to say. You want to recite this poem you wrote when you were 12, what you didn't write when you were 12, but you say you did. And that's like, you want this to be the central part of your conversation about divorce and what you and Harriet had in common. It's so lame. It's so lame. Okay, well, uh, just I'm just going to skip some of this stuff where she's like still talking about her life with her parents and just it's all just a bunch of lies and it's just a bunch of gobbledygook where she says one thing and then contradicts it to say something else. It's just like whatever she wants, whatever, however the spirit moves in the moment. Um, fast forward to life before H as everybody calls him. All of her friends call him H. She calls him H. <laughs> Megan, in America, we don't call people by their first initial. It's not an American thing. And the fact that all of her friends are like jumping on this so they can sound more British is lame. Everything's lame. Everything about this is lame. Okay, well, they all her friends want to emphasize that she had so much freedom. She had a beautiful life. Like she had everything she could ever want. She had the TIG. She was on a TV show. Um, she had her dogs. She had her hideous townhouse that suited her until a prince came into the picture. And then what he provided wasn't good enough. But... They really want to let you know that it was kind of a downgrade for her to have to get with Harry. Actually, a major downgrade because life was great till he showed up. And there's all this pressure, this unspoken pressure being put on Harry in this documentary. Like, you better not fail her because it was good before you showed up. So what are you going to do to make up for the fact that she gave up everything for you? And I, I mean, in some ways I do say it because Megan says all her friends are asking her, is he really worth it? Is this worth it? I mean, I know you say you love him, but is this how you want to live your life? But she says, of course, this is what she wanted because they loved each other so much and they stay connected all the time. And they were taking these furtive trips back and forth, mostly her to Britain. You know, he's like very apologetic about how bad it was and how they had to go everywhere in disguises and they had to drive these, you know, strange routes to keep away from the paparazzi and that it was a really terrible start to a relationship and he blames himself. Okay, well, at any point she could have ended it. You can't live your whole life being afraid and worried that the other person is resenting you. At some point, you guys have to make your peace with, that's what being with him is. He can't always apologize for it the rest of his life, you know? But it looks like that's the setup of the relationship. Megan says that it was terrible. She went to the police and said, why in the world are six guys sitting outside my house just waiting for and watching me? You know, if this was any other person, you'd do something about it. And the police are like, yeah, but you're dating that prince. So it's kind of par for the course. She's very indignant about it. But she said that finally a death threat was called in. So then they had to jump up and mind their P's and Q's and protect her. Everything changed. The atmosphere at her work changed. The paps were always milling around the st outside the studio. It made life inconvenient for her castmates. So she was really embarrassed about all that because she was... Not the sort of person that ever wants to ruffle any feathers. So it was really embarrassing for me to have to inconvenience my castmates like that. I'm sure it was kind of embarrassing. I mean, I'd be embarrassed about that. Um, you know, goes on and on. Uh, but now we come to the part where, you know, is he worth it, says the friends and family. And Megan basically was like, yeah, he was. I mean, he's worth it, but his family's a bunch of kooks. She says that, I'm so glad that I didn't know then what I know now because I just know so much now. But I just didn't realize that his family was going to be just a bunch of people that stick up their butts. I thought they were normal people behind closed doors. You know, I just figured they let their hair down, but they're just as weird, stilted, and cold as you can imagine. It's not this mask they take off. They really are that weird. She tells, obviously, this is the old story about how she had William and Kate over to the house and she come slapping her bare feet down the hallway to meet them in her ripped jeans and, you know, lace on their necks and then is wondering why it is that they don't appreciate the gesture and acts like, you know, she's just this really warm, almost maternal figure and they were cold and they found it odd that they didn't know her and she was pressing her body up against theirs. You know, a couple of weirdos that wouldn't appreciate that. She's a hugger, you guys. Okay, she's a hugger, and she didn't realize that in Britain that's like not totally what people do. It's kind of frowned upon, but I mean, that's that's kind of her thing. So she felt judged, but you know, if people want to be like that, that's their thing. If they want to be cold and hard and mean and snake like, what are you going to do about it? You know, 
So that was hard for her. But then, of course, it was also hard for her when she, without any warning, was brought to go see the queen. And, you know, they were going to go stop at somebody's house. And somebody said the queen was going to be there after after she got home from church. And, of course, Harry asked her if she knew how to bow. And, you know, we've seen this scene a million times. I'll play it for you guys. Because it's just the look on Harry's face is so disdainful about how Megan is mocking his family and his customs. And she wants him to laugh at his family with her. And it's the one time where you see him refuse to do it. Americans will understand this. We have medieval times, dinner and tournament. It was like that. Like I curtsied as though I was like. <laughs> Pleasure to meet you, your majesty. Like, was that okay? And it's probably the scene I like the best because I feel like we get a window into actually the pain that he experiences at having to disown his family to be with her. Now that's on him, right? Like you, you at any point you could have been like, okay, I cut ties here. Like this is too much for me. You are too much for me and you want me to hate on people that I love. I'm not gonna do it. At any point you could do that. But I understand to the complexities of finding yourself with somebody having building a fantasy idea of this person believing that you can be a new version of yourself i think harry's always hated himself and i think when megan came along he thought that he was going to find the new version of himself this the version he liked only to find out no i don't like this version of me because this version of me required me to hate my family and i also don't actually like her that much either but I'm going to keep believing the fantasy. Maybe behind the next corner, it'll all get better. So he makes fun of their custom of bowing to the queen. And she she compares it to medieval times. It's not like medieval times at all. Y'all, I've been to medieval times a thousand times. I used to have to go with my sixth grade class once a year because I taught them about medieval history. So for a fun end of the year event, we would go. Obviously, no one expected that it was really like medieval, like the medieval times, but it was a fun event to take my sixth grade class to. Okay, uh -huh. a cold chicken leg and some cold corn and a bunch of people in some cheap costumes are not at all what you experienced with the Queen of England, the Queen of the British Empire. Okay, so enough already of you mocking it and making it tantamount to um, a, a silly dinner show that you pay way too much for. And like, I, I was like, I, I'm truly offended that she would even compare those two things. It's so disdainful and disrespectful. And then she does that horrible bow where she comes up and she's like still trying to force a laugh, still trying to get you in on the disrespect. And Harry's not having any of it. And I love the camera was like 10 out of 10 trolling Megan by giving a close up on Harry's face as he looks at her like, okay. I love that scene. I love that scene because I love Harry's unwillingness to placate that stupidity with even the shadow of a smile. He's so disgusted, so grossed out, and frankly embarrassed. Okay, but here's the other thing that I really hate about that. And here's the other thing that I think really exposes her for the snake that she is. Megan has a history of deciding that if another culture doesn't suit her vibe, if she doesn't get why they would do a thing, then that thing is wrong. If she thinks that it's old fashioned or not modern enough for her, or it's like not what people now are doing, she's going to cut it down and demean it. And that's, and, and we, this is actually a precedent that she has. Back when she was doing all her charity work, which they really want to belabor in this episode, she went to India. Now, they don't tell you what she was doing in India because enough people would be like, wait, I don't really like the sound of that. But she had gone to India um, with the express purpose of working with this like feminist charity to uh, give women and girls sanitary supplies for their period so that they keep going to work in school. But in the culture where they were providing these sanitary pads and things so that people could keep going to work in school, it's actually against their religion to do that. Um, from what I understand, it was not well received because it's believed that women should take that week off 
um, and that that is the way their culture has always functioned as far as uh, like a woman's cycle. As an American, you can think all you want about that. You can decide that you think that that's strange or difficult or hard for that woman to like miss a week of school or whatever like that. Um, But instead of saying, oh, I'm going to run right over your culture and make sure that you all are doing things the way we Americans would do it. Why don't you just make sure that they're able to continue their education for the week that they're at home? That way, they're still getting their education, but also honoring the culture that they are a part of. Instead of just being like, hey, here's some pads and tampons. Go back to work. Sit back in that desk. You know, um, is there not another option that we could do for these women that would still honor the culture that they're a part of and is not going to get them into hot water with the, you know, patriarchal society that they're a part of? That's not our society. We don't get to just go in and say, you guys should do things the way we're doing them as far as cultural things go. I mean, I think you could have a conversation about where and what you should try to change in other people's cultures. Um, If it's violence towards people, if it's hurting people, okay, maybe we can have a conversation about that. If it's social mores and cultural ethics that we're talking about in the way that women mingle in society when they're on their period. Like there's a history of women stepping away from society during their cycle since the beginning of time. Many cultures have that. And quite frankly, when you don't feel real great on your cycle, it'd be really nice to be able to lay down and no one's, you know, blinking an eye at you. Everyone's just like, well, she's doing her thing, right? Anyway, this is a long tangent. But does it surprise me that Megan would blow up into the royal family and be like, you guys are bowing to that old lady? Why? Why are you doing that? That's your grandma. Who cares? I'm not going to bow to her. And if I have to, I'm going to make fun of it and mock it mercilessly. Okay, well, then we get on to the fact that the family, well, a lot of them thought she was really pretty and also thought, yeah, but she's an actress. She's probably going to leave you eventually anyway. So maybe you should not date her and just move on. But that then, of course, leads us into a whole conversation about, well, what was the deal with her being an actress? Was it even that big of a deal that she was an actress? Could she give it up if she got to be with Harry? And that's when we come to the part where one of her friends says, Megan wasn't even into being an actress. It was just this thing she did, but she did a lot of things. And she had that website, The Tig, and she was really into charity and service work, and she was really into women's rights. So being an actress was just this sort of thing that she'd fallen ass backwards into. And, you know, it wasn't like something she couldn't give up because there were bigger fish for her to fry. Uh, There's this huge emphasis on, like I said, her charity and social work at this portion of the documentary, but I feel like it's super lame because it's easy to make anybody look really good if you have enough shots of them standing behind podiums at like a UN women's function. But as we knew from Revenge, he went to great lengths to expose what a fraud she was in the landscape of charity work. All the work that she did in Africa and barely raised any money when she could have raised a ton of money with her with her status, even though like this was before Harry, but she was an actress on a show. She, she like she had pull. She knew people with money. She could have really raise some money for that uh, for the for the charity that she was working with. Didn't uh, when she went to one of the places where they dug a well, and it was a photo shoot for her. She had suitcases and suitcases of outfit changes so that she gets all of these pictures of her with all these African children. She's going for this whole like safari-esque vibe. She's got these long blowing scarves, lots of camo green, lots of khaki. Um, She, like the African children were a backdrop to her fashion moment. And when she went there, she was constantly going back to change outfits, going back to to fix this or that. It was, she wasn't there to celebrate the well, the much needed well. It was, I need photographs so that I can like let people know I'm really big into charity work because I'm trying to get in on the UN women's charity circuit thing. And I want to be the next big name in that. So I kind of need a couple of things that show I kind of have an interest in this whole topic of helping the thirsty kids. And then, of course, we have this stuff uh, with her in India. But, I mean, there's there's enough footage of her doing things that look really charitable and good. There's enough uh, footage of her talking behind podiums at, of big events that NAACP gives her an award and inexplicably gives her and Harry an award after the death of George Floyd, which they show with that footage as well. 
And we're just supposed to believe from this footage that totally does not explain what she was doing in any of these circumstances and just buy the narrative that, yes, she was an actress, but she was so much more and giving up acting was nothing because she was prepared to join the royal family and join their push towards the various charities that they were involved in because that's where her heart was. Then, of course, we've got to talk about the actual engagement because that's where this episode ends um, on the announcement of their actual engagement. Harry says he wanted to ask her way sooner to get married. But of course, he had to ask his grandmother for permission to do that. So he didn't get a chance to do it. But we get the, you know, the grainy photos we've all seen of them, their dog with the arms in two casts, the a little electric candles and their bottle of champagne as he asks her to marry him. And what's wild to me is that there is actual audio of her calling a friend squealing into the phone that he's doing it he's doing it he's actually doing it because she knew he was going to ask her to marry him that night because he had a bottle of really nice champagne and he went outside with flowers and was setting something up and she wasn't supposed to peek but she was literally peeking and calling her friend about it and i don't know why she has audio of that do you record your phone calls maybe she recorded the phone call because it was the night of the engagement and she wanted that remembrance but it's kind of it's kind of dodgy to you know the person's going to ask you to marry him, like let him set up his little scene with his picnic blanket and his little electric candles and his little dog with the busted arms. Let him set up the scene and don't ruin it by peeking and calling your friend and bringing in this third party into your intimate moment. That just seemed so lame to me. Um, anyway, of course they get engaged. They can't tell the whole world, but they decide to have an engagement party in which everybody attending has to wear an animal onesie. What? That doesn't seem very in the the TIG vibe. They chose to wear penguin onesies because, of course, penguins made for life. And that's their thing. That's who they're going to be. A couple of penguins. Um, now, the documentary does let you know that everyone was super happy about the engagement. Everyone except the racists. Because apparently, at this time, England was just bereft with a whole series of nationalistic racists who wanted to lock down that border to make sure that there weren't a bunch of people crossing the border. They wanted to make sure that their, their country was secure from the people who were coming in to defile it, and Meghan was a defiler. And so basically, Brexit was Meghan Markle's fault. Sad to say, you know, those Brits, they're racists. And they saw the color of her skin, and they were like, lock the border. Can't have any more of that riffraff coming in. Look at her. She's way darker than he is. If we'd locked our border and had more of a secure country, this never would have happened. So get her out and let's make Britain great again. That's basically the message at the end of the episode. We see them come out and give that interview where she's wearing that white coat and they're waving to the photographers over this old pool of water. And she says, I had no idea then that they were going to destroy me. I kept believing the narrative that it was going to get better and it didn't. And you're just like, okay, whatever. You know, it's like, it doesn't matter. You guys can play that poignant piano music all you want. I don't care. I couldn't care less. You know, it's just, <laughs> you guys, we have four more episodes to go. But it better get more interesting than this. And I know what's coming next because I remember hearing about this. I think there's this like whole episode where they decide to go into American slavery to talk about the racism that it defines Western civilization. And I'm telling you guys right now, I can't do it. I cannot make it through that. <laughs> I can't. I can't. I will, but I'm just... Uh, all of my heart, mind, and very soul is resenting the very idea of that stupid, forced intellectualization of this non-issue. Anyway, we shall see how that one pans out. But thank you guys so, so much for hanging out. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comments, which part of this story bothered you the most. I think the part that bothered me the most and always will bother me the most is that stupid bow. I can't stand it. I won't stand it. And that girl needs to find out that just because cultures are different from your own, you don't just get to rip roar in there and say, that's lame and decide it's going to be your own way. Pretty sure that's what colonizers do. Isn't that the problem you're trying to explain to us in the next episode? <laughs> All right. Well, I'll see you guys later. Thanks for watching. Bye.